uh, Vivek Ramji and Nitin Kanekamadala. <laughs> Please forgive me if I've uh, done a terrible job at any of your names. Um, if you guys would like to share your audio and video and um, jump on in. Um, Yamini is an associate engineering manager at Four Kites. Vivek and Nitin are both staff software engineers at Four Kites. And uh, Yamini, Vivek, and Nitin will be talking about envisioning API as a product. Um, as always, if anybody has some questions, um, please pop them down in the chat box um, or wait until the end and then throw them down there and we'll do some questions at the end. But um, otherwise, thanks guys. Um, yeah, uh, if you need to screen share, um, go ahead and do that. But otherwise, uh, it's all yours. All right. Very good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I guess you guys can share, see my screen, right? Yes, can see my screen, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, no, I think you will right. need to go to present mode. All right, let's get started. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is Yamini, and I work for Fokite uh, as an engineering manager, predominantly solving complex real-time problems in the supply chain visibility space. Uh, and I'm more than happy to have Nitin and Vivek, who's joining me, to delve into the technical aspects of envisioning API as, as a product. Hey, I mean, just to interrupt here, uh, can you like uh, full screen again? Like uh, I, I see your uh, top header being displayed. Uh, just a second. Is this good now? Yeah, this is perfect. All right, cool. So like I said before, um, for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to talk a little bit about envisioning API as a product. Uh, I know for sure that a lot of us are into the business side of things, and uh, we do have like a lot of offerings uh, scaling across the spectrum, right? So be it horizontal or vertical. And there would be a point where we would like to package some of the business intelligence or basically the assets that we have and then be able to, uh, you know, like just sort of share them with our customers uh, that way, you know, like uh, open up brand new revenue stream. So that's essentially what we have been, especially my team here in Focus have been looking at, at least in the last uh, a few months. And essentially, you know, the way we are planning to lay out this talk is just uh, provide a little bit of insights about forecasts. What do we do? and uh, predominantly delve into the technical and operational strategy of how should anyone start and what are the different tenets that basically we would have to factor in to make sure you know like this uh, initiative is a great success all right so that's a little bit of the agenda and on that note uh, let me talk a little bit about four kites right so we are a startup and we are in this industry like for about five years uh, so to speak uh, and uh, essentially, you know, the main objective of Okites is to deliver transparency and unleash the value in a customer's enterprise supply chain operations. All right. So we do track in over 55 plus countries as we speak. Uh, and some of our customers are Fortune 500 as well, you know, the likes of Coke, Pepsi, Ryder, Cargill, so to speak. So uh, predominantly, right. So we, uh, we have a lot of products. Uh, we we are actually getting into the data science side of things as well, and there is this is this essentially a lot of scope for us to be able to package a lot of uh, the homegrown business intelligence that we have, and there's as well a need that's coming in from our customer side to be able to digest all of this, uh, you know, that way augmenting their business and then being able to provide them with accurate insights on what is that they would exactly have to do right now. So essentially, you know, like if I'll have to keep it precise, right? So, hey, where is my truck? So this was the question that we were trying to answer, you know, like in the last few years from there to being able to say that, hey, this is when you should start to be able to reach this point uh, by this time, you know, sort of an evolution from a very simple question to being able to be prescriptive, right? So that's the, uh, that's the, that's essentially the, the scale or that's essentially the kind of problems that we have seen and uh, we have learned over time with our customers and 
that's essentially it's also putting us in the forefront to be able to think through API initiative, basically. Uh, and this slide sort of a little bit talks about the complexities that do uh, arise on the supply chain side of things, right? So it's not going to be simple. You're going to have a lot of systems, a whole lot of inter integrations per se, right? So and then uh, since, you know, like we as a visibility provider sit at the top of the spectrum, right? So we can actually create a network effect. We have the visibility to understand the different uh, optimizations. So we have the visibility to understand the different movements and be able to come up with optimizations for our customers. And essentially, all of that is turning out to, um, you know, if I have to rightly say, all of that can actually turn out to be packaged as business asserts and hence, you know, APIs, right? So this is sort of really, really exciting. And uh, I would uh, say that, you know, like we're still evolving in the space. We are actually thinking through a lot of things at this point. And at least uh, we here at Forecards believe that anybody who gets to have to play in this space, right? So essentially, we'll have to broadly think about these four verticals that uh, we have put in here, right? So uh, we have to have a strategy around the APIs, and we have to have a, a business model around the APIs as well. Uh, and these are two basic verticals that are being hashed out by product managers uh, and senior leadership as we speak. Well, we uh, specifically, you know, like uh, our team has been uh, predominantly focusing on the technical and operational strategy side of things. So if I'll have to give you a very small example, right? So there can be a customer uh, of four kites, uh, a specific division who would want to have visibility to the specific business assets that we internally have, right? So essentially, if we would have to sort of surface that back to our customers and provide a seamless experience, what what are the different set of things that we will have to do or what did we do uh, to get to this point? So that's essentially what uh, Nitin and Vivek would be covering as part of the technical strategy uh, vertical box that I have put in here. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, like the sort of introduction uh, on what, um, what, what anybody can look forward to, you know, like in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. And on that note, uh, let me uh, hand this off to Vivek. Vivek, what did you want to take this forward? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Thank you, Emily. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Vivek, staff engineer at Podcasts. So, yeah, to talk about the technical strategy, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, go for it. Uh, so, this is the kind of uh, data that uh, we provide. Uh, so, this is a live page, live.forkites.com page. Where these, these are public data that uh, we provide at Forkites. This will give you a sample of uh, the kind of data uh, that our customers uh, rely on. Um, uh, so uh, the, these APIs are publicly, publicly available, whereas where some uh, some of the APIs are restricted to uh, the customers of Forkites. Uh, so to move, move on, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah. So uh, for our API product, we started off with uh, the API gateway. Um, so we needed a single point of uh, a single interface for all the customers to interact with, and then to move all the uh, common concerns uh, that uh, that will be shared across APIs into one common layer. So and also to make in any future changes, right? So. So we, we, we evaluated uh, a couple of uh, API products, API gateway products uh, for these aspects. So in terms of authentication, uh, we, we should be able to provide uh, uh, an API key to the customer. So most, most uh, in most cases, uh, it, is the, it is an application from the customer side uh, that, that was going to use uh, the APIs. So they, they would like to they, they would most uh, likely like to integrate with uh, our APIs directly instead of using a, in, an interface that uh, Forkites is providing. So an API key would be provided. So that is one kind of an access. That, or JWT tokens, if it is an user from the customer side, will be a JWT token for development. Um, and then, uh, so in terms of validation, uh, we would like to validate the requests, the request payloads. So a JSON schema validation would be done, and then caching. So caching is uh, subjective across APIs. Certain APIs are cached for a longer duration, whereas certain APIs are in quite real time. Uh, they, they, they did not be cached. And then rate limiting was an important factor. 
so we, we we wanted to record the requests per minute uh, for every uh, customer uh, we wanted to restrict uh, uh, for certain ap we wanted to restrict the requests per minute uh, the allowed request per minute uh, and then uh, tra traffic shaping with respect to all the the api gateway would uh, interact to in interact with multiple internal services that we have and uh, any failure at one point uh, should be gracefully handled uh, so, so that, that is another aspect and in terms of monitoring we would like to monitor the number of requests that each, each api is uh, going through and uh, you know basically make any infrastructural changes uh, accordingly and then uh, with respect to logging uh, for any debugging we would like to log, log every request that we have in terms of tracing we we would like to understand uh, we wanted to understand how each call is going through to different services uh, internally and then for transformations the basic transformations would be done in the gateway uh, just the formats if it is JSON or XML. So, uh, in, in for uh, other complex uh, transformations, uh, we would rely on a separate service. And uh, also uh, the deployment part, so where, where, where we where we would want to test uh, a specific version with uh, a specific set of customers. Uh, and along with that goes versioning, right? So the, the versioning was done uh, in the header of the request. So uh, whenever a new version is put up, uh, it will be published in the dev portal most likely, and uh, it is available for a specific set of audience based on uh, who we wanted to target uh, that version with, test the version with, and then we would expose it to everybody else. Right? So. So these are the aspects that uh, we, we counted for the API gateway, and then we also had uh, uh, standardization of uh, the entities. So we have a lot. The entity is mostly distributed across uh, multiple services within the organization, uh, and it can grow. It can scale based on the scale. It can keep growing and it can keep evolving. So we wanted to give a, a very cohesive set of entities for the customers to to consume. So we came up with uh, standard entities. Let's say in, in forecast term, uh, a, a shipment is a standard entity. Uh, an address is a standard entity for a warehouses or retail outlets. So an address is a standard entity. So we came up with some uh, set of uh, standard entities for them to consume. Um, yeah. So for, for in terms of evaluating, uh, th these are the factors that we uh, came up with for evaluating API gateway products. Uh, so some were open source, some were enterprise uh, offerings. Uh, so the actual evaluation uh, strategy was to use a PUZH matrix, where uh, we would list all the features that we, uh, all the aspects that we wanted to evaluate for. Uh, let's say that feature one uh, is a high priority feature, we would give it uh, more weight. Whereas if it is a lower priority feature, it, we would give it a lesser weight. So the, based on the priority, we would keep giving a weight. And then each uh, of the gateway product was uh, given a score for each of the aspect. And we would choose one that has a higher score. So even if uh, the lower priority features are having a higher score for a particular, uh, let's say that we have a gateway one and gateway two. Uh, if you see in this example, if you see in gateway two, we have a lower score for a lower priority feature like feature two and three, but in for feature one we have a higher priority, which is a higher priority feature. We have a good score. See the overall score reflects uh, reflected is higher, so we would choose gateway two in this case. So this helped us choose uh, the right fit product for our uh, use case. Yeah, so 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 to give an example, uh, feature for for a high priority feature would be something like uh, authentication or a rate limiting. So these are higher priority features for us. Um, whereas um, let's say caching uh, would be a slightly mid priority feature. 
uh, maybe deployments or versioning would be a slightly lower priority feature or a dev portal offering that comes along with the sorry uh, the dev portal offering that may come along with the product may be a lower priority feature we can develop it in house so hope that helps uh, so next up uh, handing over to my colleague nitin Hello, API days. Uh, so my name is Nitin. I'm a staff engineer here at Fort Kites. So in these slides, I just want to talk about uh, developer side of things, right? Uh, so, so to speak. So there are two parts to every API, right? So you have a producer side of it as well as a consumer side of it. So the producer side of it is the guy who's actually building our APIs. So that is essentially us, Fort Kites, who is thinking about how to model, how to like bundle them how to like uh, design them properly so that they can evolve over time, how to rate limit them properly, how to throttle them properly, how to version them properly and all these stuff. To the consumer side of things, uh, so those are like developers, applications who want to like integrate and use our APIs. So it becomes a crucial point that uh, we provide everything that we want to the consumers so that they can integrate with zero support. So uh, our ideal experience here is that uh, say you provide a developer portal to your consumer applications, right? So say you have a customer of yours and you want to like start integrating. So they want to start integrating your API. The ideal version here is you provide them your developer portal and say within the next two minutes, they are able to hit your API and get a response. And they have everything that they want in order to integrate with their application in the next 10 minutes. So at least the idea of it, right, should be that uh, they should require like zero support. So developer experience in my focus is one of the prime factors that affect uh, your integration speeds with an API. So this is like especially crucial for four kites because we have so many integrations across the supply chain. So for example, if you look at uh, the shipper side of things, carrier side of things, broker operations, facility operations. So all of these have uh, systems that reside across the uh, supply chain and the data exists very much in silos. So the data uh, exists in a single localized uh, domain and there is no interconnection or there is no uh, transfer or sync of data between all these silos. So it becomes crucial to sort of allow them to integrate between each other uh, to sort of get the data out. So for example, right, say you have a facility and you are a facility owner. So all you are worried about is when a truck, uh, when will your truck actually reach your facility, right? So either you are looking for like an inbound shipment where uh, you are expecting some goods, or it, it might be an outbound shipment where uh, you are actually the manufacturer and you want to send out goods. So in both these cases, uh, the main thing that you are looking for is when is my truck going to arrive? So this knowledge of when the truck is going to arrive uh, may not be available to the facility guy, but uh, to the uh, actual carrier, uh, it is a readily available information. So they are the people managing the truck. So they may have had like uh, devices like GPS uh, that can provide like accurate locations. So in order to plug this information together, it's like the crucial point to any API that we built. So a few points here that I have mentioned is core to developer experience, right? So one of them is to have a seamless integration with your API gateway. So what I mean by that is uh, whenever someone wants to use your developer portal, right? It should be seamless enough uh, just populate your API keys in the background whenever they log in, and they should be able to like uh, play with your APIs instantaneously. Look at all your params, look at your requests and responses, and sort of play around in such a way that by the end of the uh, session, they would like probably know this is the application I'm going to build and this is how it should be built. The second one is around Open API spec. So if you look at this, uh, most of the time we are looking at uh, an API specification that exists in silos again, right? Like the developers build out uh, a specification, the developers build out a, uh, an API implementation and they sort of uh, integrate with the API gateway. But then our dev portal can sort of uh, wither out, like um, there can be a disconnect between what exists in the developer portal versus what is actually implemented in the gateway. So this brings uh, uh, some problems with respect to the manageability and the consistency uh, between the developer portal content and the actual API that is uh, being displayed there. So in order to bring this change, right, 
the best way to do this is to actually integrate both your portal and uh, spec together. So this way, whenever your spec changes, we can automatically set up a deployment process to actually deploy your developer portal. So this way, uh, both your changes are always consistent. So whenever a change goes into your API, it also reflects in your dev portal so that it maintains consistency throughout. And your customers need not bother about like, well, like mentioning whether or checking whether your content is actually accurate or not. So the third point I want to mention here is the language and SDK support, which is again crucial. So a users of a developer portal, right, are different from UI users. So most UI users, I think, are like novice users with respect to application management, correct? So they are mostly uh, thinking about things like UI, uh, the usability of filters, the usability of uh, your buttons and all that. But developers are most focused on how can we integrate this in the next five minutes? So what languages can I integrate in? What SDKs that are readily web available that I can probably use and just plug into my application and integrate it in the next five, 10 minutes? So this is what we are looking at. So in order to do this like quite effectively, like uh, generation is auto generation is the best way to go. So once you have an open API spec, you can probably uh, auto generate all of them in multiple languages and uh, provide access to your uh, SDKs in all the languages that you want. So the last two parts, I think, are really crucial in maintaining consistency and allowing your developers to actually customize the look and feel of the developer portal. So, so this way, if you wanted to like sort of roll back versions or something like that, it would be possible. So, so this definitely brings to the context of version controlling your dev portal content. So that way, every change that goes into your system uh, is actually controlled and the other obvious, I think, advantage here is you can have a, your own approval process. Because if you think about it, uh, an API from design to uh, release goes through too many teams. So it has to come to a developer. It has to go to a product manager. It has to go to a implementation manager. It has to go to someone from ops who has to verify it. It has to go to our executive team who have to verify it. It has to go back to customers who have to like test them. And it goes to release. So all these portions, uh, we need to like have a streamlined way to automatically approve sort of releases uh, to the pipeline. So this is where a CI/CD approach uh, like glows perfectly. Um, so you can have a, a clear approval process or a release process that will enable you to like move along the release pipeline in a smooth and effective manner, and maintaining your consistency with your API portal. So this way. Uh, your developers are happy, your internal team is happy, your customers are happy, and uh, it becomes a zero support experience for your internal team. So next slide, please. So in this slide, I just want to focus on some of the non-functional requirements with respect to APIs. So when we think of APIs, most of the time we are bothered about functionality, right? Like what is the data that is being returned? Are they are the correct fields returned? Are, uh, are the like the data in the correct fields? Uh, are they accurate? Uh, are the predictions that we are making accurate? So this is like a one half of the problem. The other half of the problem that is like not visible uh, for customers is uh, the non-functional uh, requirements that I have mentioned here, right? So the main way to focus on non-functional requirements, so as to speak is to look at them as evolutionary sort of uh, requirements, right? So the way to go for this is something that is uh, adopted from ThoughtWorks, from their evolutionary architecture to something called as fitness function driven development. So the logic here is uh, for every non-functional requirement that you have, you would create a fitness function for it. And once you create this fitness function, you actually uh, add it to your code pipeline. So when your fitness function fails, you break the pipeline at that place and allow your developers and your team to actually fix those fitness functions. An example of this can be, say, uh, your API performance has to be, on average, say, it has to be 100 milliseconds. And uh, that is what the contract that you have set. So this is a non-functional requirement, right? Uh, because it's not concerning about data. But you still want to give the best experience to your uh, customers. So what we could theoretically do is, in your development pipeline, you can have a stress test or a performance test down the pipeline. 
and say during your performance test on average if your uh, latency increases by 50 percent to say 150 milliseconds which is more than 100 milliseconds is what you want you can fail the pipeline at that instant so this way we are ensuring that no matter what the changes are there in your api the non-functional requirements always consistently remain so uh, i have given a few fitness functions here and uh, the core sectors that are displayed here for example you have code quality an example for this uh, would be test driven development you can have unit tests that can break your pipeline the second one is to maintain resiliency which is availability or fault tolerance so this can be achieved through something like uh, um, a chaos monkey or something like that where you uh, break your components and ensure that they are available for observability and performance you can have something like uh, correlation ids or trace ids and for performance you can have something like addex which is a very good score on how to determine your uh, performance of the application like how many requests are like uh, within your time limit how many requests are failing how many requests are like very slow um, you can have something on compliance and audit and operability. So all these factors uh, help us in uh, making sure our APIs are like operationally efficient and they evolve very well over time. So just the last slide here. Next slide, please, Yami. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. So these are some takeaway best practices that I have, um, which will help in designing good APIs. So always adopt a open API spec first approach to design. So this way, uh, even before you start development, everyone is in sync, your team, your product team, your exec team, your uh, customers, and everyone. Uh, when designing APIs for REST, particularly, use level two or level three in the Richardson maturity model. So this uh, provides uh, uh, far more maturity for your APIs and ensures them that they are consistent. One of the problems that I usually see is uh, people do not build APIs for business use cases. Rather, they tie it to internal entities or tables. So this is especially dangerous because uh, um, your APIs will grow too humongous. That is one. And your customers will not see the actual value of your APIs. So always build your APIs for business use cases. The other parts, I would say, are like uh, very core to API design, sort of using accept headers for version control of your APIs. So this will ensure that your API links or uh, your paths do not change over time. Uh, always use headers for credentials so that they are not logged anywhere. Always build an aggregation service internally so that uh, your gateway does not need to take care of all these complex aggregations. Uh, return custom error and uh, request IDs so that uh, it helps with debuggability, right? So for example, if you have a developer who's saying, I have a 5xx, so they can probably give you the request ID that is returned, and you can probably debug it in like no time. The last one is a concept of circuit breaking that I feel is very crucial to microservices as such, so as to prevent something like a cascading failure. So this way, if a component, uh, if a single component has failures, it does not bring down the entire system, right? So we can probably circuit break it at that particular component level and fall back gracefully. So these are some of the best practices that we have seen with API design, development, and how to expose it to your developers. So this is our API journey. We are open to questions. Yep. yep. Essentially, in the interest Thanks of time, the yep. we want to restrict to the key pieces that we went through right now. And just wanted to put the thought forward that uh, any business, so long as we have uh, homegrown intelligence and we see value, uh, I guess you know, like we can and should think about uh, envisioning uh, those asserts and packaging them as APIs. So yeah, that's the point that we wanted to put forward. And yeah, that's that's pretty much. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, I know in the chat, if anyone else has questions, please throw them in. But at the moment, um, we have a question. And it's, in your opinion, um, the auto-generated SDKs, are they consistent enough to expose through the developer portal? Um, so let me answer that. Uh, so auto generation as such, right? I don't think uh, uh, it provides for any consistency. But the best way to do this is once you generate your SDK, write down tests for your SDK that will ensure the code practices that we want, right? So for example, every language has some kind of uh, guidelines on 
uh, what the effective best practices are and you are supposed to have tests in every language and test to ensure that the quality of the language is maintained uh, and so that way the sdk that you have outputted tests for two things mainly so one it tests for the quality of the sdk and two it checks for the correctness of the apis through a testing process so this way every auto generated sdk that you have goes through the single pipeline before it gets deployed to a single place where customers can use so definitely the auto generated sdks are not consistent enough by default but we can have tests around it and uh, make it mature enough so that the sdks are consistent enough to be exposed to a developer portal okay um uh, not a question, but uh, Nick has just said great presentation uh, to you guys. So Nick really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you, Nick. I was, you. Uh, I was wondering with the uh, with the auto gen, is that something that you moved to, um, uh, or is that something that you started out thinking that you were going to try just auto gen um, everything? Yeah. So uh, we uh, initially had uh, given SDKs manually in the past. Um, but I think uh, the main focus here is uh, it doesn't scale, right? We would have to auto generate it in order to scale to multiple languages. And mm -hmm. the list of languages is like never ending, obviously. So it becomes a crucial point wherein uh, the only way to like give out SDKs auto generated is to ensure that you have quality within those APIs, uh, quality within the SDK, and to ensure that uh, all the best practices in code are followed. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, uh, and uh, another comment that just says uh, good information. And thank you, guys. Um, um, so, I would you guys be available to answer any more questions in the chat? If uh, if anyone else had some queries for you. Sure. Sure. Um, cool. Uh, we've just hit time, so I have to. Um, I'll, I'll break off. Um, thank you, guys, very much. I really enjoyed that one. Um, you guys can stop uh, screen sharing if you'd like and. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.